heads. Heavenly Father, it's so good again, as I said earlier, to be in your house. I would just ask that you would bless this sermon this morning that I'm to be giving. Let it not be my words, Lord, but your Holy Spirit speaking through me. In Jesus' name, I ask this. Amen. A while back, I came across the amazing story of Mark Inglis. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Didn't to me either. In 2006, Mark climbed Mount Everest. And you ask, well, what's so amazing about that? There's been a lot of people that have done that, right? Mark Inglis did it with two artificial legs. I don't think I'd want to tackle that. You just had knee surgery, Jim. Are you ready to climb Mount Everest? <laughs> In 1982, while serving as a mountain guide on Mount Cook in New Zealand, he had been caught in a severe blizzard, forced to take shelter in an ice cave for two weeks. He suffered severe cold, and both legs had to be amputated below the knee. But Mark didn't sit around and mope. Rather than feel sorry for himself, he went back to school and became a research biochemist. I don't think I could do that. I just barely got through my chemistry courses in college. <laughs> a research biochemist. And he continued to climb mountains. Eventually, he scaled Mount Cook again on artificial legs in 2002. Then in May 2006, he achieved the ultimate. He stood atop Mount Everest. What an accomplishment, huh? Today, we see wheelchair athletes competing for gold medals at the Paralympic Games. We see disabled people earning respect and achieving in all walks of life. But it hasn't always been that way. There was a time when a disabled person was considered of no value whatsoever. But God's value system has always been a little different from that of the world. Aren't we thankful for that? Referring to our scripture reading for the day that Danielle just read, News had just come that the enemies of God's people, the Philistines, had dealt a terrible blow to the nation. Saul, the first king of Israel, had been killed in battle, along with his son Jonathan. This meant that Saul's grandson, Mephibosheth, was now in danger. The Philistines would stop at nothing to eradicate all the relatives of Saul. So the nursemaid of little Mephibosheth picked him up to flee. In her haste, she dropped him on the floor, breaking his ankles. And Mephibosheth, who under other circumstances might have been the king of Israel, became a fugitive and a cripple. Now consider the life this poor man as Mephibosheth had. His father was killed in battle when he was only five. He was handicapped for life as a result of someone else's carelessness. And later on in the summer of his life, he was slandered and robbed of his estate by his own servant. This man today would have been considered a born loser. Furthermore, he was of the wrong bloodline. When the next king ascended the throne, Saul's descendants became outlaws. The descendants of the previous king were considered a threat to King David. The record says that Saul's house and David's house were at war, and David was winning. So Saul's descendants were an endangered species. Mephibosheth didn't have much of a future. 
Here is a man who really got a bad deal in life. You think you got it bad? Think of poor Mephibosheth. Here is, he, even his name, if you want to know what Mephibosheth means, his name even meant shame. However, in spite of the bad blood between the house of Saul and David, David and Saul's son, Jonathan, had become close friends. When Jonathan was killed in battle, David was heartbroken. Have you ever had a good friend like that? I remember in grade school, in the third grade, I think it was, we had one of the, his name was Charles, I forget his last name, but he was really a neat kid, and I was, he was one of my friends there. But he ended up dying there in the third grade of some nasty disease, I don't remember what it was now. But I can understand this a little bit when you read these things, when you've lost a close loved one. One day David began thinking about his dear lost friend Jonathan and wondered if perhaps he might yet have a son alive somewhere that he could honor. Eventually David discovered Jonathan's one living son, the cripple Mephibosheth. David sent for him and so Mephibosheth came trembling before the king, probably thinking that David wanted to kill him. You got your Bible, Sandy? Let's turn to 2 Samuel 9, and we're going to be looking at verses 6 through 8, and we'll pick up the story there. Second Samuel 9. Verses 6 through 8. I still hear paper, paper rustling. Okay. Verse 6. <clears throat> now when Mephibosheth... Mephibish, okay, let's hear you say it. <laughs> Mephibosheth. Now when Mephibosheth... Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David. He fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for thy Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Obviously, obviously Mephibosheth didn't have a very high opinion of himself. Just a dead dog. That's all he was. Well, how would you feel if your name meant shame? He was not used to this sort of treatment. Even in our society today, people have, who are disabled know what it means to be excluded, treated differently, unable to participate in many activities. But in today's society, the disabled can speak out for their own rights and demand respect, equality, and accessibility. 3,000 years ago, things were different. A man like Mephibosheth, unable to walk without assistance, would be considered less valuable than an animal in most societies back then. If you couldn't work and contribute to the community, you were nothing but a burden. There were no disability rights groups to speak up for people like Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth, the man whose name meant shame didn't have much experience of people treating him kindly or generously. Whenever people had treated him like this before, they had always wanted something. And since he didn't have much to give, he was rarely treated with kindness. He had never encountered unconditional love. 
and didn't know how to relate to it. Mephibosheth was handicapped in more ways than one. I don't know whether you realize it or not, but everyone is handicapped. Some handicaps are visible in the body and some are not visible in the spirit. Some are minor, minor like not being able to walk, and some are major like not being able to love. All of us are handicapped, disabled in some way by sin. We are not whole people, but God looks beyond our disability to the person inside and loves us anyway. I'm sure Mephibosheth thought like many people today still think that a person's worth is determined by what they can do. Mephibosheth didn't understand at first that David loved him because of his father, Jonathan, not because of anything that Mephibosheth might do for him. And isn't that the way God loves us? For the sake of Jesus, I don't care what you look like, what talents you have or you don't have, or what handicaps you have. You are precious to God simply because you are. Romans 5.8 says, But God commanded his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 4.19, we love him because he first loved us. Have you ever wondered what God sees in us? I certainly have. What on earth can you or I do for God? Will we, re- will we enrich him with our offerings? What can you tell him that he doesn't already know? What song will you write him that he hasn't already heard? What gift will you give him that he doesn't already have? King David himself, the same man who cared for and honored Mephibosheth, had cause to wonder himself at God's love and concern for him. David himself had a few disabilities not visible ones, for he was a strong, vigorous warrior king. No, his disabilities were invisible, like many of ours. Tucked away inside a heart that sometimes rebelled against God's wise guidance. David the king, David the generous benefactor of Mephibosheth, David the sinner was also David the poet, author of many of the beautiful psalms in our Bible. In Psalms 8, verses 3 and 4, he wrote, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained, what is man? that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man, that thou visitest him. Why does God care for us? What do we have to offer him? Just one thing. It is the most precious gift in the universe, yourself. You are his treasure. You are the most important thing there is to him. Jesus loves you. You mean more to him than the throne, more than the glory, more than the crown, more than the angel anthems, more than heaven itself, because he left all of those things just for you. 
Now, does that make sense to you? It doesn't to me. Not at all. I cannot explain it. It's total nonsense. It is too good to be true, but folks, it is true. The Lord is good. Have you ever heard someone say of a couple in love, what on earth does she see in him? I'm sure we've heard that. Unconditional love is irrational. You cannot explain it. Sometimes we say, I love so-and-so because she is so considerate of others. I love so-and-so because he is such a gentleman. As human beings, that's the way we love. We take a person's qualities, good and bad, into account when we decide to form a relationship with them. And if you're hoping to marry and start a family with someone, or even go into business with a partner, it makes sense to place conditions on that relationship. As human beings, we need to be cautious. Sometimes we need to protect ourselves. But folks, that is not unconditional love. God does not love that way. He loves us because he loves us. Really? He is love. If God's unconditional love can be compared to anything in our human experience, And it's hard to say this next part because of some of the things you see in the news now. But it probably comes closest to the love most most parents, underline the most, parents. Most parents feel for their children. That's why the Bible so often speaks of God as a loving father or compares him to a mother nursing a newborn baby. A baby can't give us anything or do anything for us. A baby simply needs our constant care and attention. Yet we humans love our babies and children just because of whom they are. That is a little bit like God's unconditional love. I say a little bit. That's a tiny glimpse of what God's love is like. When we get this through our heads that we are infinite, of infinite value to God simply because we are, it can work a revolution in our lives. No more pro- problems with self esteem. You're worth something, folks. Not because of anything you've done, because of the love that the Lord has placed upon each one of us. Now, we can love ourselves, which also makes it possible in turn to love others unconditionally once we see this. We can even learn, maybe you're not here yet, we can even learn to love lazy people, spiteful people, negative people, Ugly people, stubborn people. Has anybody ever met any of these folks? Maybe some of, I know my wife's probably married to one of them. (laughs) Stubborn people. Or Mephibosheths, like ourselves. Jesus tried to tell us how much we are loved. And I'm going to have you turn there. Luke 12. Okay, let's open our Bibles again. Luke 12. And we're going to be looking at verses 6 and 7. Okay? Luke 12, 6 and 7. I got a little story that goes with this. And I got plenty of time here. I'm glad because I asked my wife if it was okay if I shared this. And she, she said it's okay. So don't think bad of me. I did approve it with her first. Okay? Are you there, Luke 12, 6 and 7? Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, 
and not one of them is forgotten before God. But even the very hairs, even the very what? Even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. I wish I had the mic here now, but I don't because I like to wander with this. many hairs. I, I, a few years ago, uh, how many have husbands? Don't raise your hands, okay? I don't want to know. How many of you husbands have wives that color their hair? I don't want to know. Just You can do this a little bit if you want. So my wife colored her hair quite a, for quite a few years there, and then I started noticing in the bathroom great clumps of dark brown hair. Not coming for me. I'm, I'm, I'm losing mine. But. And so I said, honey, I'm seeing a lot of your hair here on the floor. What, what's going on? Do you think maybe it's that stuff you're putting in your hair to color? That's pretty strong stuff. And uh, I said, I'd, I'd much rather be buried to a gray-haired woman than a bald-headed woman. <laughs> and I said, beside, even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. You're putting a lot of work on the Lord. You know, he has to keep recalculating here all the time to keep up with you. Thank you for letting me share that. Honey. So yes, God knows the numbers of our hairs on your head. Now, what possible use could God have for such a statistic? Well, let's see now. You got 4,333,000. Oops, you lost one there. He is simply trying to tell us every way, he, every way that he can how much he loves us. Think about it. If somebody loves you so much, you're going to sit around and count your hair. They must think something of you, huh? Sorry, Lamont. Maybe you can count the beard. <laughs> so maybe you don't have a sparkling personality. Maybe you have no musical talent, as if that mattered. He can call more than 12 legions of angels to sing the most exquisite hallelujahs, but he never died for the angels. He died for you. No angel can render him the gift that you can render your heart. When someone finds buried treasure from an old sunken ship in the ocean that is all covered with coral and algae and encrusted with slime, he does not discard the gold on account of the dirt, does he? Well, you and I are like that. We're covered with filthy rags. But there is gold underneath. I don't know where he's finding it here. Maybe you feel that way sometimes. But there's gold underneath that he's looking for. He wants to refine that. God can take care of the filth. Salvage is his business. I like that. Salvage is his business. Like Mephibosheth, we are crippled and have nothing to offer God except our love and loyalty. Indeed, like Mephibosheth, our very present, our very presence poses a threat to his government. But just as David loved Mephibosheth, so God loves us for the sake of his son and wants to restore to us all of the property we lost as a result of our rebellion. He even offers us a seat at his table. Jesus wants us to be his dinner companions throughout eternity. Use your imagination and try to draw a picture of that. In fact, he has extended to us a remarkable invitation 
and I'm sure that we're all familiar with this. I'm not going to have you look it up. But it's in Revelation 3.20. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. I will have you turn to this one, Luke 12. Looking at verse 37. Luke 12, verse 37. This is, we need to remember this one. This is a good one. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he who, Christ, right? He shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. Boy, does that make you feel small? My Savior is going to serve me? Just think about that for a moment. Jesus himself is going to put on his apron, ask us to sit down at the table in the kingdom of God and wait on us himself. That's overwhelming to me. I can't imagine that. What a savior, what a God. At that great feast, wouldn't it be interesting to find Mephibosheth and if you kind of wedge yourself between him and David or between Jonathan and Mephibosheth, sit there beside Mephibosheth and ask him, say, could you tell me about your glory days in the court of the king? But then I'll say to him again, but I'll bet that wasn't anything compared to what you're seeing today. Jesus serving us. And he'll shake his head and say, all this for a poor cripple. And that's where we are, folks. We need to realize that we're all cripples. But we have a Savior that loves us. Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for this story of Mephibosheth, Lord. It gives us hope, Lord. We need to realize more how much worth we are to you, Lord. And we got others out there that need to hear this message too, Lord. Help us to be good servants and share this wonderful message to others that they are loved. The world needs that right now. In Jesus' name, amen.